Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is uh, Paul Wu, uh, Dr. Wu, and uh, this is my partner, Porter uh, McRoberts, and we are uh, interventional uh, pain uh, physiatrists uh, in South Florida, and we're, today we're going to talk to you uh, about uh, lumbar spine, I'm going to have uh, Dr. McRoberts, who's an expert uh, of the spine, and uh, to t let us know a little bit about anatomy, and hopefully this will help you understand a little bit about your pain. Thank you. Uh, well, the, the lumbar spine does a whole lot of things. It is uh, an elegant design when it's working well. And because it's such a, an, a complex structure, um, it's, a, it's prone to failure. And uh, as we use this thing uh, along our lives, it's, uh, it also can wear out. And when it wears out, sometimes it causes pain. So today we're going to talk about the structure of it, what it does, what it provides for us, all the things it does. And then we're going to look at the spine from a different direction. What are the things that can cause pain? And some things are, are normal and don't cause pain and due to aging, some things do. So, welcome to the spine. So what we're looking at is uh, the spine from uh, a patient who was very kind, donated, just joking, their spine uh, after they died. Um, this one's made out of plastic. So we have five lumbar vertebrae. We define lumbar vertebrae as being the vertebrae that are between the sacrum, or this big piece of bone, and actually the bottom of the ribs the thoracic spine. So in most folks, and I say most because it's not true in everybody, there are five lumbar vertebrae. And they're big. Their, their main job is weight bearing. They are the things that support the entire weight of your upper body resting on your hips and your lower body. They're the only bony connection between the two. And so as you can see, the discs are large, the vertebral bone is large, it's made for carrying the load. What it also does is elegantly uh, protect the, the nerves that supply everything south of your belly button. These are the, what we call the cauda equina, or nerve uh, that is uh, associated with what we call the horse's tail. But all of these nerves, everything that's happening south of the border, and that's a lot of important stuff, is housed right here. This is the, the main conduit of information, up to the brain and down from the brain. In front, we have the discs. Uh, we call them vertebral discs. They're named for the vertebral bony body above and below. So say this bottom most disc, often the largest disc, is called L5-S1, named after the body above and the body below. And this L5-S1 disc is complemented by L4-5 and so on up. These discs are rugged. They're designed, they're thick, they have a large uh, circumferential annulus is what we call it. It's a very thick fibrous uh, tissue that contains the nucleus pulposus, or something like a jelly. It's a jelly donut. It's a very, very strong. What flavor? I don't know. That's a good question, but I love jelly donuts. Uh, but this one is, is designed to last your life. Um, you can't eat them. So, as you can see in this model, this, this kind of uh, uh, red and uh, inflamed uh, thing is supposed to represent a disc bulge. And as the disc fatigues, as those annular fibers, those steel belted radial uh, loops that go around uh, the disc uh, fatigue, they may fail and become a little more floppy. And as they do, sometimes the actual juice inside the donut will uh, form an aneurysm through the wall and outside, and there'll be a bulge. There's a l different levels of degenerative disc disease. Sometimes it's contained, sometimes it's a little bit of bulge affecting nerves, sometimes it's a big old uh, screaming rascal right here and it uh, actually can be pressing on the nerve. This is an extra foraminal disc bulge right here. It's right outside the foramen. When you say foramen, can you point to us what sure. is uh, foramen and what, what is that importance? Well, foramen actually means in Latin window, and specifically the term in Latin is neuroforamina, which means nerve window. I told you he was smart. Well, I'll know a few things. So, and that's what's coming in and out, is the nerve. Mm -hmm. What also slips in and uh, takes a ride is a few veins and occasionally an artery. You've got to be careful for those arteries. Mm -hmm. But uh, the foramen is this hole right here. And when we take an MRI, say we get a sagittal cut right down the middle, and we take a few segments over, we often can see the foramen and, and assess the, the size of it uh, quite readily. When the foramen gets small, let's say you've worn the disc and it's lost height, the foramen will actually shrink down inside and get small. Sadly, the nerve will not adjust. It will just be the thick, robust thing it was previously, but the working room is, is narrow. What you can also have is additionally is a little bit of arthritis from the front of the facet joint, encroaching and crowding uh, the space, wow. the, the window. And just like when you have a window that gets small and smaller, less light gets through, 
If it gets very, very small, the less nerve information gets through. These nerves, the spinal nerves, as we walk, piston in and out. They're lubricated by a bunch of what we call perineural fat. Mm -hmm. And as we walk, they go in and out by about one and a half to two inches each gait stride. And if you think about it, like a rope going through a very tight hole, if it's well lubricated, there'll be no wear and tear on that rope. But as it gets more and more narrow, wearing and tearing each part of that gait cycle starts to fray, rub, and sometimes even destroy the nerve. Wow. So we, we have a few options for treating that. And we'll talk about epidurals, we'll talk about surgery here in a minute. I would say this is kind of like a fat man trying to get through a very thin door. We've got two options. We put the fat man on a diet, and that's what we do when we do an epidural. <laughs> we give him some steroid and reduce the swelling in the nerve, try and make him fit in his home. Or we can surgically enlarge the door for the fat man. Now, of course, surgery is a big deal. And uh, it's something that you want to avoid if you can. But if, if, if you have to, this type of surgery actually people do fairly well with. And you're referring particularly like uh, for foraminal narrowing or the window narrowing. The window you're trying narrowing. to fix the window. Yes. Let's say you had a disc bulge, for example, mm -hmm. and this little bulge is affecting the nerve. It's actually a very, very successful surgery. People should have a low uh, threshold or, or low amount of worry about having that kind of surgery. It's a great surgery. It works a very high percentage of the time, well into the 90s. So it is good to know. Because when you have a problem that uh, you can't fix with an epidural mm -hmm. in the lumbar spine, like a pinched nerve from a disc, right. the surgical option is a, is a pretty safe one and good one. It works a uh, high percentage of the time. Okay. It's one of the times we really like to do surgery, which is, which well, is rare. Just, right. <laughs> so if we move back from these, uh, these discs and these uh, vertebral bodies, we'll see something called the pedicle. This is a big piece of bone that connects the back working part of the spine Talking about between this and this, this piece of bone right here? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so it connects the load bearing part of the spine to the articulation of the spine. And as you work back here, you see these facet joints, something you talked about up in the cervical spine. Mm -hmm. These are another main source of pain. Mm -hmm. And they can become worn uh, over time. As the disc settles, more pressure is placed on those facet joints and they become more and more arthritic. A lot more load is taken off of the disc and placed on the facet joints, and they have to do the work. That the uh, the joint, or I mean, sorry, the, the disc was formerly doing. So, how often do you have uh, this problem in the facet joints? That's a good question. You know, if we get MRIs of uh, of even young folks uh, under the age of 60, for example, mm -hmm. um, you'll find a majority of them will have some wear and tear in their facet joints. Not all of them will hurt, though, and that's one of the things, uh, the quandaries that we still don't really understand quite well. Why some people hurt and some people don't, even with the same pathology. That's very true. So what we do, you and I, is try and figure out, even though it's a disease, or even though it appears abnormal on the MRI, is it actually a source of pain? And that's why we do things like facet joint nerve blocks, for example. We're actually taking the exam right down to the joint, injecting a little numbing medicine in or around the joint, around the nerves, seeing if we can take the pain away. So where's that nerve? That's a good question. So the nerve that goes to the joint, there's actually, for each joint, there's two separate nerves. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's somewhat of a, of a conundrum because if you just block one of those nerves, you would only block half of the joint. You would still have pain from the joint. That's why you have to do two nerves for each joint. But the nerve takes a track. It comes right off the spinal nerve, and then it wraps around here, and it kind of one, one branch goes down to the joint, and one branch goes up to the joint above it. So it actually splits into two what we call medial branches. So we do a medial branch block, the dorsal primary ramus, and that's how we numb up the joint. Wow. Yeah. And that's also what we do when we do an ablation. We try and target that little nerve sitting in a place that's far away from the spinal nerve, far away from the spinal cord, or the disc, or any other sensitive structures, sitting right in an exposed spot where we can get to it easily and safely. And it's right there on each one of these little these spots. So the facet joint can cause pain. But then, as you might notice, you see all these bony prominences? They're bony and they're prominent because they are anchors and attachment points for muscle and ligament. And this thing right here? Yes. Oh. It's a transverse process on either side. This is a spinous process. I often make the analogy to an antenna. This is a long, skinny thing, just like an antenna. And if you're driving along and you see a radio antenna, for example, coming up next to the radio station, you look up, it's tall. And have you ever seen one without guide wires? No. Nope. Those are those wires that go from the antenna down to the ground that keep it from falling over, even in a light breeze. Without those things, I think the thing would just fall right to the ground. It's such a thin, flimsy structure. And actually, if we strip away all the muscle mm -hmm. from the spine and load it with anything more than, say, eight pounds, 
it will start to wear and crumble. It is wow. the muscle and its attachment point that sews up the spine just like those guy wires and that's why spinal health really relies on muscle. Once the muscles get weak, then we're, the load bearing part of the spine is, is the muscle, or the, the, the bones, the bones, the joints, and the disc. So I always heard about the core. Yes. Okay. Can you, what's the core? I mean, you know, I mean, obviously it's, it's just not. It's something stomach. none of us works enough on. Oh, right. At least that's what I'm told. Well, I'm course. actually uh, tucking on my stomach right now. I feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> the core is the muscular structure that surrounds the entire spine, and okay. it's everything from the abdominals in front, the obliques on the side to the muscles in the back that wrap around, the quadratus lumborum, the, uh, uh, all, all the muscles that sew up the spine, the paraspinous muscles we call them. They're individual small muscles, uh, multifidus for example, that sew up the individual segments. And there are a lot of muscles that attach even in between the segments here, 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 here. It's like lacing up a shoe. But uh, that's the core. When we try and exercise the core, we're trying to build a muscular corset. Just like we have a back brace, but instead of the back brace being this external clumsy thing, we want to build the back brace inside of us. That back brace is the core muscles. So you're saying that we naturally have the back brace. We do, but a lot of us let it go, yeah, me well, included. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so one other thing we talk about this a little bit is the sacroiliac joint. I think it's probably worthy of uh, a uh, talk of, of its own. Some, I agree. But um, that's essentially in short the lumbar spine. So can you explain a little bit, just based on what you're telling us, the anatomy, you talk about the window, the disc, uh, the facets, you know, obviously if you have surgery, some of this uh, area is going to be gone. I mean, what type of uh, intervention, let's say for instance, someone who have uh, uh, a pinch nerve with uh, this disc herniation, what sure. do we do? Where do we go? Where do we go? Great question. Let's say we had an L3-4 uh, herniated disc that was pinching the L3 nerve going down the leg. And probably wrap around. That's the dermatome. Then the it right. So here's uh, L5, L4, L3. Here's the L3-4 foramen, and lo and behold, this would be the L3 nerve. So let's say we we're to do an epidural, putting the fat man on the diet, so to speak. We take our needle, we walk it down here, touch it to some bone, walk it around, and simply come hugging in the back, right behind this spot. Sometimes we can go on the disc in the lower part of uh, what we call Kamen's triangle. We can slip around here. The main idea is to avoid the sensitive structure of the nerve, but yet get the medicine to flow up into the spine and around the herniated disc to reduce the inflammation that's caused by that uh, that egregious pinching. So that's uh, that's the other way you could go, say surgically, a microendoscopic discectomy. What you do is you take a little trephine, a little uh, needle. You go down. You gradually dilate the the muscles mm -hmm. out. And then you can see through a microscope down to the disc, and you take tiny little curettes, and you basically scoop out that disc herniation, relieving the pressure off the nerve. Okay. Uh, can you talk about a little bit as far as uh, what, you know, the, <clears throat> for instance, once you uh, have surgery, what, what, how does that affect the muscle and... Uh, That's a great question. It depends on the kind of surgery. Right, of course. And of course, different surgeries have different uh, risk and different uh, risk of good outcome versus bad outcome. Hmm. Say for something that's a very challenging uh, surgery, a multi-level fusion, you would have to go in and fuse, that means take the disc out and replace it with bone that would then grow between the vertebral bodies at each segment. So depending on the segments, you right. have to do it at, at each additional one. And so with each additional segment, the rate of success sadly goes down. It's just a more challenging surgery. It's one thing to do something well, but it's another thing to do it again and again and again and again, all while a patient's on a table, all while you have the aorta right here, while the heart is beating, Preserving all the nerve roots, etc. It's an extremely challenging surgery to do. I can imagine that. Yeah. And we are getting better and better and better at it. But the problem is that sometimes fusion may not even be the best thing for the remainder of the spine. Yeah. I mean, I, it's you know, I think it sounds like uh, you know, we maybe in the future we should have uh, another talk regarding uh, uh, you know sponsor. treatment basis based uh, with anatomy. I agree. Uh, you know, so people can understand better. I agree. Let's close this and we'll move on to the thoracic spine next or maybe even on the lumbar spine surgery. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.